Hello Year 10, this is now Lesson 6 in the Digestion and the Digestive System in Humans Unit B1.3. At the end of Lesson 5, I asked you to complete page 18 in your booklets in preparation for this lesson. So the first thing we're going to do is to go through these answers. So you had a number of different digestive juices and needed to fill in the table with the words provided. So if we start with saliva, saliva is produced in the salivary glands and is secreted into the mouth. Within saliva, you would find amylase enzyme, you would find water and mucus. The second juice then is the gastric juice. This is produced in gastric pits and released into the stomach. Within that, you would find acid, protease enzyme and mucus. The third digestive juice is one we've talked about before is bile that is produced in the liver. It's released into the first part of the small intestine, which is called the duodenum. Within the duodenum, then obviously the bile is there to neutralize the acid coming from the stomach. So it contains an alkali substance but it would also contain bile salts and pigments. The fourth digestive juice then is pancreatic juice that is made in the pancreas and again released into the duodenum. Within the pancreatic juice, you would have the three different enzymes. So, sorry about that. So you would have lipase, protease, and carbohydrates. The last juice then, the last digestive juice is the intestinal juice. This is made in the villi. It is secreted into the small intestine. And again, just like the pancreatic juice contains the three enzymes. So lipase, protease, and carbohydrates. So if you can make sure that your booklet now matches what you can see there on the screen. So you were then asked to answer these four questions. So what sort of enzyme is amylase? It is a carbohydrate because it's breaking down a carbohydrate. What is the name of the protease which is released in the stomach? You may need to have um, looked this one up. It's called pepsin. Which digestive juice does not contain any enzymes? Looking at the table, you can see that that is bile. And then name three carbohydrates which are released into the small intestine. Again, this may have needed a little bit of research. So the first one is amylase. That's the one we're familiar with. But you would also have enzymes like sucrase, which breaks down the sugar sucrose into glucose and fructose. And you would have an enzyme called lactase, which is breaking down lactose into glucose and galactose. What we're going to move on to in today's lesson, and this will roll into um, the next lesson as well, is to have a look at an investigation. So in this investigation, we're going to be investigating the amount of energy released from burning food. So as you should know, there is energy contained within your food in the form of chemical energy. In our bodies, we would break that down via respiration to release the energy. In our investigation today, we are going to release that energy by burning the food. So we're changing that chemical energy into heat and light energy 
and looking at measuring how much heat is being given off as a measure of the amount of energy that is within that particular food. This experiment is sometimes done by burning a peanut. Now, if you look at the screen, you can see that there's a link there to a YouTube video. I've put that video link onto Study Zone as well underneath this video. So I'd like you to stop this video now just briefly, have a look at that video and it will show you a basic version of what we're going to do in our investigation. So it would show you how you would go about doing this if you were burning a peanut. So on that video, as the peanut was being burned, it was releasing heat energy and light energy. The heat energy then is being measured. A single burning peanut, as you can see at the bottom there, will release about 8,000 joules of energy. It takes about 14,000 joules for you to walk briskly for a minute. So have a go at this calculation. How long will you have to walk briskly for to burn 8,000 joules? Okay, so probably the easiest way to work this out, you know that in 60 seconds, you would use 14,000 joules of energy. So if you divide 60 by 14, it would tell you that for 1,000 joules of energy, it would take you about 4.3 seconds. So all we need to do, so that's for 1,000, you would need to times that by 8 to get how long it would take you to burn off 8,000. So it's about 34.3 seconds. So in the experiment that we're going to do, we are going to actually burn biscuits instead of peanuts. In your booklets, if you can turn now to page 21, which should look like the information you can see on the screen. So we're investigating how much energy there is in food. We are going to be comparing the amount of energy released from a low fat biscuit with a full fat biscuit. So our investigation is going to be about capturing the heat energy that is released as we burn the biscuits to compare. So obviously the more heat energy that would be released from the biscuit, the more energy is inside it. Okay, so in our investigation, we're going to be comparing the amount of energy in a full fat digested biscuit and a low fat digested biscuit. As we're going through the video, what I would like you to do is try and write down some information on page 21 about the variables. So as you're watching the video, think about what the variables are in this experiment. So the first thing we're going to do is to weigh a piece of biscuit. This will be important later on because we're going to try and calculate how much energy there is per gram of biscuit. So we're going to use about a quarter of a low fat digestive biscuit and that has got a mass of 4.02 grams. So I'll record that information ready for later on. Our next step is to measure out 40 centimeters cubed of water into a measuring cylinder. Okay, so we've now got a measuring cylinder with 40 centimetres cubed in, just making sure it is completely accurate there to ensure a fair test. So you should have two control variables that you've identified now. So the mass of the biscuit, the volume of water that we're using. The next step would be to pour that water into a boiling tube that is attached to a clamp stand. You notice the boiling tube is at an angle and that will be important later on when we are burning the biscuit underneath. So we'll put 40 centimetres cubed of water into the boiling tube and we're going to take the starting temperature which is 18 degrees C. It's important to take the starting temperature 
because we're going to take the temperature then at the end as well and see how much the temperature has increased by throughout the course of the experiment. So we'd light a Bunsen burner. Need to make sure we keep the Bunsen burner away from the equipment because we wouldn't want any heat from the Bunsen to be going into the tube. And we would then light our piece of biscuit. Need to make sure the, the piece of biscuit is burning before we remove it from the Bunsen flame. And we would then hold the piece of biscuit about a centimetre below the boiling tube. So we've got another control variable there where we hold the biscuit is really important. So about a centimetre underneath the bottom of the boiling tube and we're going to hold it there until the biscuit is fully burnt. If at any time in this experiment the, the biscuit goes out, we would need to put it back into the Bunsen flame to relight it. And we need to make sure that we are burning as much of the biscuit as we possibly can to release as much of the energy from it as possible. Okay, the biscuit's burning really well now. And obviously as the biscuit is burning, heat energy will be going into the water. And the temperature on the thermometer will be increasing. So you can see it takes quite a while for us to, to fully burn the biscuit. It looks like it's just about coming to the end now. The bit you might have trouble burning is the bit obviously that's held by the tongs. So that bit, it won't be fully burnt, but it's as much as we can get it. So it's now finished burning. And our next step would be to retake our temperature, which is 57 degrees C. So it started at 18 and at the end of the experiment, the temperature is now 57. You would then repeat the experiment in exactly the same way using the full fat biscuit. Okay, so hopefully as we went through that video, you should have been able to identify what the variables were. With the independent variable, what we're changing is the type of biscuit. So we had a full fat biscuit and a low fat biscuit. Our dependent variable obviously is, is the energy that's released, but it would be the temperature change that we're measuring. We'll use that temperature change then to convert that into an amount of energy that was released. Control variables, you should have been able to identify um, some of these. So control variables would be the mass of the biscuit. Try to make the masses as close as possible. The volume of water. And where we hold the food, okay? So the distance of the food under the boiling tube. In your booklets now, can you make 
by here, please, a list of the apparatus that we used. Okay, so you're filling in there a list of the apparatus and also then copying this diagram into your book where it says diagram of apparatus. Pause the video, write an apparatus list, please, and draw that diagram into your booklet. Once you have your apparatus list and the diagram of your apparatus, what I would like you to do on the lines underneath is to write out a method for this experiment. If you can't remember how the experiment is carried out, rewind the video, watch, watch it again, and try and write out the method as you go through. Okay, so pause the video here, write your method, and when you're ready, come back to this point in the video and we will carry on. Okay, so hopefully you now have um, a method written in your books for this experiment. The next thing would be now to have a look at the results. So you have this table or a similar table on page 23 in your booklets. Your table in your booklet hasn't got quite enough columns. So I'd like you to add one in. So at the start of the table if you just add in an extra column or split one of the columns into two so that you've got six of them. So make sure your table now matches the one that you can see there on the screen. So we're now going to start filling in our results. So when you watch the video, you will have seen for the low fat biscuits to start with that the mass was 4.01 grams. Our starting temperature was 18 and our end temperature was 57. We did the full fat biscuit as well. So with the mass of the full fat biscuit, it was 4.05, so very, very similar. The starting temperature again was 18 because we used fresh water and a fresh boiling tube. And our end temperature for the full fat was 65 degrees. So we now need to work out our change in temperature. So for the full fat, the change in temperature was 47 degrees C. And for the low fat, it was 39. So what we're going to do now is to convert those changes in temperature into an actual value of the energy released. So we've got an equation just underneath where we're going to work out so the energy released from the food per gram. You would need to take the mass of water, times it by how much the temperature has gone up, times that by 4.2 and then finally divide it by the mass of the food sample. Okay, so we're going to do these calculations. You might want to write these down on the lines uh, back on the previous page after where you've got your method. So for our full fat biscuit, so using that equation, the mass of the water we used was 40. Our temperature increase for the full fat biscuit was 47 degrees. And we're going to times that by 4.2. And finally, divide it by the mass of the food sample, which was 4.05. So if you can have a go at doing that calculation now, so it's 40 times 47 times 4.2 divided by 4.05 would give us 1,949.6 joules per gram of biscuit. So for every gram of the full fat biscuit that we burn, you would be releasing 1,949.6 joules of energy. 
If we repeat this now for the low fat, so again, we used 40 of water. Our temperature rise for this one was only 39. Again, 4.2, and our mass for the low fat biscuit was 4.01. So if we do that calculation, 40 times 39 times 4.2 divided by 4.01, that gives us so that gives us an answer of 1,633.9. So if we go back now to our table, and we're going to fill in these values into our last column. So energy per gram in the full fat was 1,949.6 and in the low fat was 1,633.9. So as you can see from the results, there is more energy released from the full fat biscuit than from the low fat biscuit. We know that in our bodies we use fat as an energy store. So that explains why there was more energy in the full fat than the low fat biscuit. And obviously people will, will eat low fat biscuits maybe if they wanted to lose weight. So it makes sense that there would be less energy within them. Now, obviously, we've only done this experiment once. So we don't know whether our results are reproducible or repeatable. So what we would usually do with this experiment, each group within the class would get a set of results and then we would collate them into a class set so that we could check if our results were reproducible. So in your booklets, again, if you still have room where you've got the lines, I'd like you to draw out this table where we're going to now collate some other results for us to be able to compare ours with. So we'll put our results into the first column. So 1,949.6 for the full fat and 1,633.9 for the low fat. Now we're going to put in some results from when we've done this experiment previously. So group two was 2579 and 2598. So a bit higher than ours there. Third group then was 1737.9 for the full fat and 1004.8 for the low fat. Next group, 2240 for the full fat, 1438.5 for the low fat. Group five is 1963.1 for the full fat and 998 for the low fat. And then finally, group six. For the full fat, they had 2,579 and the low fat, 2,598. I'd like you now to pause the video and calculate the averages for these results, please. Okay, so our averages for this then, for the full fat, we have 2174.8 and for the low fat is 1711.9. So using those results now, I would like you to write a conclusion on page 23. So which type of biscuit has the more energy in and can you explain why? And then if you can answer questions 1, 2 and 3 at the top of page 24. So it's about comparing our answers that we got today with the other group's answers, working out a range are there any anomalous results? And what is the mean average value for each of the different foods for the class results? We've already done that one. So writing a conclusion at the bottom of page 23 and then questions one, two and three at the top of page 24, please. Okay, so these are the three questions there at the top that I would like you to do now, please.
Okay, so if we have a look at the answer to question one, the range for the full fat, the highest is 2579 and the lowest is 1737.9, which would give us a range of 841.1. .1. So for full fat, the range is 841.1 joules per gram. And for the low fat, your highest value is 2598. The lowest is 998. So we've got a bigger range here. So maybe that suggests these results are not as accurate. We have 1,600 difference between those results. Do any of the class results look anomalous? Um, you could argue that groups 2 and 6 are anomalous because the low fat is... A higher value than the low fat. Um, those groups probably have also shared their results with each other. And question three, what is the mean average value for each of the different foods for the class results? We've already worked that out. That would be your 2174.8 for the full fat and 1711.9 for the low fat. So next lesson, we're going to continue to have a look at these results and we're going to see how we could improve our method. There were lots of places in our method where energy was being lost. So next lesson, we're going to have a look at a different way of doing this experiment to make sure we are measuring all of the energy or as much of the energy being given off as possible.